So for the rest of today, we'll talk about kind of the one of the other halves of the European Middle Ages. Uh, now I've kind of laid a political history kind of fo foundation groundwork. Uh, so we'll talk about how religion gets involved with all this, and especially how religious leaders try to propose solutions for all this chaos, all this violence that seems epidemic in European society. Um, and we've talked about uh, all this on this slide so far. Uh, so just a kind of quick reminder, uh, feudalism becomes a, an attempt at social stability and political stability and economic stability. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it really fails. It creates a system of even more violence, even uh, more epidemic violence, uh, or a motivation for violence amongst the counts and lords and knights. Um, how primogeniture uh, created unemployed younger sons that are militarily trained, uh, which is always kind of dangerous in society. You don't want your military veterans feeling desperate because they can, uh, people that are used to violence can uh, turn to violence to start careers in it. Uh, so we've talked about all this stuff at length uh, earlier. And uh, the leaders of Christianity, they try to come up with some way of motiv motivating people to be more peaceful. So they'll use the religious message and you know, threats about going to hell and whatnot uh, for you know, committing violent acts against defenseless people. Um, and they'll try all kinds of different statements, uh, really to see what works, and they'll try to scale up what works as much as possible. Uh, so one of the first ones they come up with comes known as the peace of God, and that basically says that trained, armed knights cannot fight unarmed people, peasants. It becomes uh, illegal in, the, in God's eyes. Like God will punish knights that go out and victimize and brutalize uh, just average working people. So the peace of God says that knights can only fight other knights. And they obviously don't want them fighting counts and lords because that's you know, assassination. Does that make sense? And of course the counts and lords try to enforce this uh, to try to put some kind of limitations on what knights are allowed to do. Uh, it doesn't always work because a lot of these knights still go, they conspire to go after counts and lords to try to promote themselves. Uh, but a lot of knights do start following this idea that at, at least they're not supposed to be attacking defenseless peasants. So that reduces the violence just out there in European society a little bit. And another becomes known as the truce of God, which is basically that the church has all these holidays on the calendar. And what are the most important holidays in Christianity? Christmas, Christmas is one of the big ones, but not the big one. What's the big one? Jesus. Easter. So that's the day of celebrating the resurrection. So the church makes it basically illegal to fight on these religious days, these holy days, which are basically what holidays are. And that one works really well. Uh, when knights and lords and whatnot, they're told that they'll go to hell for attacking and killing and causing violence on Easter or Good Friday or Christmas Day, uh, they actually avoid it. They, they don't commit violent acts on those days. So what does the church do next? Yeah, they increase the amount of holidays. So all these new holidays start popping up all over the calendar uh, to try to clamp down on the violence as much as possible to make it illegal on more days so that the violence is somehow controllable. Um, a lot of those kind of secondary religious days are uh, not followed as strictly as the big ones like Christmas and Easter and whatnot. Uh, the truth of God also says that you should not be fighting in religious places, which are largely in Europe, churches themselves and the homes of religious leaders. And that one seems to work pretty well because it just becomes a, an idea within European society that anyone who kills someone else in a church is automatically going to hell. No matter anything else they do in their life. So that one works so well that uh, a lot of knights, when they're kind of traveling around, and they see that their enemies are 
following them, what do those knights do? They look for the local church as fast as they can and they try to get inside that building because they're, they hope at least that the enemies are not going to try to kill them inside the building. So if they find the local church and they get inside, uh, you know, the religious people running the church often give them shelter and, and food and whatnot. Uh, what do the enemies often do? They just go home? Wait outside. Yeah, they set up camp outside the church and wait for the guy to come walking out so they can kill him then. So this ends up being like a standoff, sometimes right at the, the steps leading up to the church door. And sometimes it'll go on for days and weeks. It's waiting for the guy to come out. So you still get that every once in a while. Um, and it becomes a kind of popular idea within Europe throughout the Middle Ages. And if you're afraid of being attacked, get to the church as fast as you can. So, questions about those at all? So you see how kind of theoretical ideas have real-world kind of ripple effects um, in everyday life. Um, but the big ones, though, are the Crusades. These are the big ideas that the Christian church leaders come up with to... Uh, try to solve the problem of violence in Europe. And um, the Crusades have like, several kind of big goals. Uh, the big obvious one is that Christian leaders in Europe basically start giving speeches, and we'll talk about a few of them real briefly. But the general idea is that uh, the Muslims have conquered the eastern Mediterranean coastline, including Jerusalem and some of the kind of holy sites where Christianity started. Uh, that's part of the, the Muslim empires. And there's several different Muslim kingdoms that are all interacting with each other. Uh, so at this point, there's one, not one unified uh, king of all, uh, all this territory. There's many kingdoms, just like there's many Christian kingdoms in Europe. And those Muslim kingdoms fight against each other over land and resources and whatnot. Um, but the European idea is... Muslims have control over the Holy Lands, as the Europeans call it. Um, and so the Europeans should get all these extra knights and counts and all these people that are used to fighting, professional soldiers, get them together and build up like this giant European Christian army uh, to travel down through Constantinople and then attack down into Anatolia, which is Muslim-held territory, and get to Jerusalem and uh, so-called liberate the Holy Lands from uh, Muslim control. Does that make sense? And a secondary idea is that this will help clamp down on the violence in Europe because you're going to get rid of all those extra knights and you're going to send them somewhere else. All these guys that are causing the violence in Europe will now leave Europe and go out and occupy the Holy Lands. So there won't be as much violence in Europe. Does that make sense? You take all those violent people and get them the hell out of town. Send them somewhere else. Let them go fight somewhere else. Is that clear? All right. Uh, but this idea of crusades, uh, the big ones get going in the late 1000s. But there were crusade-type ideas already floating around in Europe, um, especially in Iberia, which is modern-day uh, Spain and Portugal. Um, that is already controlled by... a. Muslim kingdoms, uh, at this point called the Moorish kingdoms. Um, that's because the Muslims, to go back to the map, bigger map for a second, uh, the Muslim empires had conquered across North Africa in the 700s, and then in the early 700s had attacked across uh, the so-called Strait of Gibraltar, way off to the you know, top left corner of this map and had attacked uh, modern-day Spain, Iberia, and conquered it in the early 700s. And they still hold it by the 1000s. It's still uh, part of a Muslim kingdom. So even by the 800s, there's already ideas starting to float around in Europe about a religious kind of holy crusade to kick the Muslims out of Europe and uh, push them back out into North Africa. So uh, Iberia is a big part of that. So there's like this 
crusade idea, the, the word crusade is already floating around in Europe. Uh, largely directed at Iberia at this point before the official big crusades to, to go after Jerusalem get going. So it's a term that's already fairly well known to you know, religious people and military people in Europe that pay attention to this stuff. Um, and uh, Christian armies will attack into Iberia to try to kick the Muslims out, but that fails, and they'll try over and over and over again through the 1400s. So this is a process that goes on for hundreds of years. And is eventually successful in 1492. And that's where a country of Spain is kind of proclaims its independence and becomes a European country. Does that make sense? Questions about that at all? So that's one area they're already talking about crusades. Another one, uh, Muslims have attacked and are controlling Sicily, this island just down here in the middle of the Mediterranean. So that's a Muslim-held territory, and the idea of crusade is also kind of floated to build up a European Christian army to attack Sicily and kick the Muslims out of there. So the word crusade is already fairly popular, well-known in military circles in Europe. But the big one, the big idea of crusade really gets going to get the Holy Lands uh, really, when the Byzantine Empire, the leftover of the old Roman Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Empire, at first they had controlled Anatolia, this big peninsula, to the east of Constantinople. Constantinople's right here, smack in the middle. Um, and over the decades, uh, the Muslim kingdoms had attacked the Byzantine Empire and gained control over a lot of this peninsula, Anatolia. And the Byzantine emperor at Constantinople asked the Pope to help uh, gather together a European Christian army to attack the Muslims in Anatolia and uh, take it back for the Byzantines. Does that make sense? So again, the idea is floating around in all these different areas around Europe, kind of on the European borders about this idea of crusade to take back certain land from uh, uh, Muslim political leaders. And uh, sometimes the attacks happen, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. It's really kind of hit or miss for the Europeans. But this suggestion seems to uh, really get the Pope's ear. And uh, it's 1089, I can't remember the exact it written down somewhere. Uh, but the Pope, Urban II, um, proposes in a sermon officially that uh, European soldiers should come together in a religious mission to not just go after Anatolia, but to conquer down into the eastern Mediterranean and take back Jerusalem and uh, the so-called Holy Lands. And the Pope has several layers of motivation that historians have argued about over the years, uh, about why he would want this to happen. Uh, number one is there is what was called the Great Schism at this point already going on in Europe. Uh, it's really a religious debate between Western European Christians and Eastern European Christians about the exact nature of uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So they're arguing about that already. And there are threats every once in a while of one group or the other to break away from the official church and start a new movement. So there's a possibility of the unified Christian church splitting in half. And some historians argue that the Pope suggests this, this crusade, in order to bring them all back together again under their one project that they can all agree on. This sounds good to both sides. Does it make sense? Um, and well, another problem with the schism is that there's another guy claiming to be Pope. 
And so Urban II is arguing against that guy trying to retain the official position for himself. So proposing that all Christians come together and go off on this like this mission that God sent us uh, to go conquer the Holy Lands or to liberate the Holy Lands uh, makes the Pope Urban II makes him look like the official leader of all Christianity. At least human leader. And maybe if people recognize him as that, they'll forget about the other guy that's claiming to be a leader. And of course, as we already talked about, uh, it's an opportunity to get all these extra soldiers, all these knights running around in Europe, causing the epidemic violence, uh, get them together in one massive army and send them somewhere else. Then the violence in Europe will end. Does that leave your vulnerable to outside attacks? That's one problem. <laughs> Send all your army somewhere and they might get attacked somewhere else. Uh, there's another fairly clear problem with this. This idea of just get them out of town. They're going to come back someday. They might come back even more violent, even more bloodthirsty and cut up than they left. So is that really a long-term solution? That's the question I always raise. What happens when the war is over and people come home? Is they supposed to stay out there forever? I don't know. Uh, other questions? No? All good? Oh, ready? Okay. Uh, 1095. Yeah, that's it. Um, so Urban II gives this big sermon in a town called Clermont in France. Um, and the sermon proposes that the Europeans get together this massive Christian army and they go out and conquer the Holy Lands. Um, and it's an extremely popular message. Uh, basically, he tells uh, the Europeans, if you volunteer to go out and fight for this, uh, God will forgive you for all the sins you've committed in your life so far. Um, God will protect your property back home, so even if you kind of leave, if you're a count or a lord or something, you leave your territory and you go off on this crusade, uh, that no one's allowed to take your land from you while you're gone, even if you're gone for years, come back eventually and it, it'll still be there for you. And that any new sins you commit will be forgiven by God. And what kind of sins can you imagine soldiers committing in warfare? Murder. Yeah, they're going to be killing people. Rape. Yeah, probably rape. They're going to be stealing property. There's going to be theft. And all. There's going to be all kinds of horrible things. I mean, war is a horrible type of thing to do. And uh, the Pope says that God forgives you in advance for all those bad things you're about to do when you launch the invasion. Especially if you're, if it's violence against Muslims. Because the Pope says they're, they're basically infidels, they've turned their back on God, and they're, uh, you know, God's not going to be angry if you kill him. And uh, that's another reason that the Europeans love this idea. Uh, there seems to, I mean, where's the downside for them? For the Europeans, at least, right? Because if you get killed on the battlefield, what's going to happen to you? You go to heaven. You go to heaven because you're fighting for God, right? Does that make sense? So it's a win win win. You're either going to win the battle and you're going to gain some lands and. You can get rich by stealing, and you can kill the enemy, and you can go back home and keep the land that you had before. Uh, but if you get killed on the battlefield, you immediately go to heaven. What, where's the downside? So it's an extremely popular message throughout all of Europe. And the Pope, after this sermon, uh, it, there's such a positive reaction to the people who heard it, 
that they had it printed up and distributed throughout churches all throughout Europe. And the Pope actually goes on tour. He goes to one city after another giving the same sermon over and over again. And uh, everyone loves it. So this creates a whole like movement of people beyond just his original message that will the idea of these crusades will last long beyond Urban's own lifetime. And this, this idea will keep reappearing in Europe, will keep popping up for centuries. So there's going to be many crusades. Um, and the painting up at the top is a famous painting of Urban kind of showing up at the church and then in the next panel giving the sermon. So it's kind of like a, like a comic book depicting time and events, right? In different panels. You've seen comic books before? You're aware that comic books exist? Okay. <coughs> Mm -mm -mm. All right. So this idea is so wildly popular in Europe. Um, Urban wants the kind of big leaders, the big counts and kings and whatnot of Europe to really organize this thing. But it actually gets out of hand. There's one guy who uh, becomes known as Peter the Hermit who um, starts preaching himself, who's kind of a homeless guy. He travels from town to town and uh, says that... Uh, uh, he's been given a revelation from God that it's actually the peasants of Europe that are supposed to do this. It's not the knights and the trained soldiers. So a bunch of peasants start following this guy, Peter the Hermit, and they go from town to town and their numbers grow. And uh, Peter's message is basically, uh, we're going to go kill all the infidels. And he seems to intend that the infidels are Muslims in the Holy Lands. But a lot of his followers, as their numbers grow, they kind of turn into a big mob that's going from town to town in Europe, slowly making their way toward Constantinople, toward southeastern Europe. Um, a lot of them seem to interpret infidels also meaning Jews. So in many towns, they uh, massacred the Jewish population of those areas in Europe. So the idea has gotten out of hand. And violence is even greater than it was before the sermon in the first place. So uh, it's just a kind of marauding waves of mass murder. And of course, Jewish groups go into hiding and they try to escape it as much as they can. So you can already see a kind of heavy anti-Semitism within European Christianity even this early on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and eventually, uh, Peter and his big, big group of thousands and thousands of uh, European peasants, they get to Constantinople. Uh, and they kind of resupply. Uh, the Byzantine government's really in favor of this stuff because they'll they'll give money and supplies to anyone who's willing to attack the Muslim armies. Um, and then they come out of Constantinople and they go into Anatolia and they attack a professional Muslim army. And what happens to them? They get annihilated because these are farmers that don't know how to fight. They don't really have a lot of weapons. And they're going up against trained, seasoned, professional troops. And they get wiped out. Um, the peasants seem to believe that they had God on their side and that God would intervene to help them. And uh, they're basically wiped off the battlefield pretty easily when, when God did not intervene. So they're a little shocked by that. But that doesn't stop the crusade idea. Um, basically, the kings of Europe and the Pope says, well, those were like unprofessional. They weren't organized. They didn't know what they're doing. Uh, so the crusading, the official first crusade still gets going uh, a couple years later in 1099. And uh, they do build up a lot of professional you know, trained knights. And they go through Constantinople, and they attack down into Anatolia, and they win battles against the Muslim forces, uh, largely because the Muslims are fighting amongst each other. There's many different Muslim kingdoms around this area. And they eventually make it all the way down to the Eastern Mediterranean, conquering lands, and they attack Jerusalem. And they conquer Jerusalem in summer of 99. And they say they have liberated the Holy Lands. Uh, so the Europeans conquer all of Anatolia, basically, and down into the coastline. And they try to occupy the place for the long term. 
They set up new governments, um, well, come to be known as client states, basically puppet governments, especially along the coastline, to control this so that Christians can like, come on a uh, pilgrimage down to Jerusalem and not have to worry about uh, crossing into Muslim kingdoms or being attacked by Muslim armies. Um, one giant problem, though, even in this first crusade, which has the most success of any crusade, uh, the Europeans don't trust each other. These counts and kings and lords and knights, uh, when they conquer territory, they start fighting amongst themselves about who should govern it. And even small territories, individual towns and little pieces of the countryside. So the European First Crusade is not very well organized and they don't trust each other, and they start fighting each other over land throughout Anatolia and the, and the whole coastline. Does that make sense? So in reality, they've taken their feudalism system with all its inherent violence and just kind of exported it to this area. And the uh, violence replicates itself. And it starts again. And when uh, several Muslim kingdoms come together, and unite and organize themselves, they launch a counterattack uh, first at Edessa, which is up there in the north, to try to cut off the rest of these European kingdoms from resupply. And piece by piece, this Muslim counterattack uh, takes God, decades. Uh, eventually, they retake the whole coastline and reconquer Jerusalem and kick the Europeans out. Does that make sense? So the First Crusade succeeded for a while until the Muslim kingdoms kind of figure out how to organize themselves and launch a counterattack. So the Europeans come up with a Second Crusade. Um, so over the next 30 years after the Muslims have counterattacked, um, the Second Crusade is largely organized by the French king and some German kings. Um, they do basically the same thing. They go through Constantinople, and then they, uh, in the end, they launch a naval attack to try to get to Jerusalem. And the Second Crusade retakes Jerusalem. And then the Muslims counterattack again uh, under their big leader's name, Saladin. And uh, the textbooks will often say he organized the Muslim kingdoms, uh, which is, or he united them, or something like that. Uh, he's really a pretty brutal type of a monarch and uh, really destroys anyone who opposes him. So the Muslims get behind him, often not by choice. And they launch a counterattack in the late 1100s and they retake Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is going back and forth, back and forth for about 100 years in the first two crusades. And the Muslim counterattack. Does that make sense? So neither side can really control the place for the long term, at least in the first hundred years. So by 1190, the Muslims have control over the Holy Lands again. So what do the Europeans do? They try to get back together and launch a third crusade. Uh, this one is largely organized by the English king, Richard I, and he tries to get the French king involved and some German kings involved. Um, but this is really Richard's kind of project. Um, this one runs into problems almost immediately. Number one, the big German king named Frederick, uh, he starts traveling down with his army. But when they go to cross a river... The king's boat capsizes and he drowns. So Frederick is out. And the Germans think this is a bad sign, so they kind of break down amongst themselves and some of them go back home. Uh, Richard, the English king, tries to sail all the way to get to um, at least the area around Jerusalem with his army to launch a, a naval attack. And he's expecting the French and the German kings to launch a land-based attack on Jerusalem. But the German king is dead, 
or one of the German kings. Um, and the French king thinks that if the English king is out of this country, this is a good opportunity to attack England. So the French king ends up staying home and trying to uh, gain as much land from England as he possibly can. So again, the Europeans are fighting amongst themselves. So the only guy who, uh, the only army that really arrives to try to attack uh, is the English guy, his army, and they attack, but they fail. And um, let's see. Yeah, there's a king, a uh, picture of the king. Uh, Richard the First is often called the Lionhearted because he took leadership of this crusade movement. Um, and, but his invasion failed, and he spends uh, the rest of his time basically trying to get back home. Uh, he's traveling through mainland Europe, uh, he gets kidnapped, and the kidnappers try to ransom him back to the English government. Um, but while Richard I is gone out of England, his younger brother, Prince John, is running England itself. And this is where you get the Robin Hood story, right? The evil King John was a tyrant and oppressive of the people. Sound familiar? And the people just want their good King Richard to come back home and get rid of this younger brother who's running the place badly. You guys have seen Robin Hood movies? Yeah. Yeah. So what usually happens at the end of the Robin Hood movie? They kill the king or John? Well, they usually, I, don't know, I guess it depends which one you're watching. I haven't seen the most recent one. But uh, usually the end of the other movies, um, the king comes back. The king arrives in England, Richard. And he basically yells at his younger brother and says, you really screwed this up. And uh, Richard I kind of takes over the government again and everything's all right. Because he's like a good, honorable type of guy. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, Richard I, he never gets back home. He tries to raise an army to reattack France, but he eventually dies. So he never really gets back to England. And so Prince John becomes King John. And he'll be king for the rest of his life. And he continues running England into the ground. He's not a very good king on any level, or maybe for his own kind of greedy self. But he causes a lot of problems uh, tax in taxation and really oppressing people who speak out against him. To the point that the counts and the lords of England uh, trap him one day and they force him to sign what they call the Grand Charter in Latin of Magna Carta, the Great Charter which is basically a document that says the king is giving these rights to the people that they cannot be you know, jailed without having a criminal charge brought against them. Uh, they can't be like, uh, basically kind of executed without being convicted of a crime, without evidence. Uh, their homes cannot be searched without a warrant, all kinds of things. So the Magna Carta is often seen as a a first kind of early European government statement of some amount of what we today call natural rights, human rights that people have that even the king cannot kind of overstep. Does that make sense? And why did the king sign this? They would have killed him. Yeah, they told him, you're going to sign this paper or I'll kill you. So he signed the paper. And the idea of those natural rights, it becomes pretty solidified in England for the most part. So that even by the 14 and 1500s, there's an expectation amongst the English people that they have these certain rights that even the king cannot uh, throw in the trash. So it becomes uh, kind of institutionalized within their, their laws and their society. And uh, that's the beginning of a slow transition toward more kind of equality and democracy. That's largely a story for History 6. Let's see. So the Third Crusade, though, fails. Right? Uh, Richard I didn't reconquer the Holy Lands. So eventually, in the early 1200s, a Fourth Crusade is proposed. 
and several monarchs get involved in this in England, uh, their big problem though is that they don't have enough money. They need cash to pay the soldiers and get the resources and the food and the weapons and all this stuff together to launch the invasions. So uh, the Fourth Crusade leaders, as they're moving their soldiers through Europe, they stop off in Venice, which is in northern Italy, to raise money. And Venice is its own kingdom. So the leaders of Venice said, okay, we'll give you a bunch of money as long as you do something for us. And that is, the thing they want done is to put a guy from Venice on the throne of the Byzantine Empire. Because the Byzantine Empire was doing things that you know, the leaders of Venice didn't like, so they want to replace him. So the leaders of the Fourth Crusade say, okay, we'll take your money, they take on the guy from Venice, and they go to Constantinople, the Byzantine capital, and they have this guy from Venice crown the new king of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Byzantine government and a lot of the Byzantine population doesn't like this, and so uh, they overthrow the so-called Venetian candidate. And the Fourth Crusade, in order to keep the money flowing from Venice, they attack Constantinople, conquer the city, burn a big part of it, and try to, you know, control the place. So, in that effort, which in the end fails, um, the Byzantine emperors come back, um, the Fourth Crusade never gets out of Constantinople. They never actually attack Anatolia or get down into the Jerusalem neighborhood at all. They get bogged down in Constantinople, so the Fourth Crusade can't even really get going. Does that make sense? And they do such damage to Constantinople that many historians say that this really weakens the Byzantine Empire to the point that uh, after these crusades kind of kind of peter out. Um, the, the later big uh, Muslim Empire, the Ottoman Empire, will start launching counterattacks and now that Constantinople is weakened, uh, the Muslims can conquer the city, which they do in the mid-1400s. So the Fourth Crusade destroyed their own protection, basically, because Constantinople is seen as like uh, the solid rock that's going to stop the Muslim invasions of Europe. And by invading Constantinople, they destroy its defenses, or a whole lot of it, which opens an opportunity for the Muslims to invade at some point. <clears throat> and once they conquer <clears throat> Constantinople in the 1400s, then they'll launch out from there, they rename it Istanbul on this map, and they'll start attacking the rest of Eastern Europe, and they'll continue doing so for hundreds of years. So Europe is open to constant invasion from the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Empire, for hundreds and hundreds of years after this Fourth Crusade. So that's a long-term effect of that. That's going pretty far into history six. Questions about that? Modern Western history. Um, and the Crusades don't even stop there. Uh, after about the Fourth Crusade, there are several other attempts, but they're usually not like unified of major European kings. There's like attempts by some kings and attempts by other kings. So, especially after the Fourth Crusade, you start getting all these numbers. And uh, it starts getting really confusing because some textbooks will call one movement an official crusade and other textbooks won't. So the numbers stop lining up really well with each other, depending on you know, which books and which documentaries and whatnot you're accessing. Does that make sense? So the Fourth Crusade is the last kind of solid one that we can put a number on. And after that, historians argue what other of these movements are official crusades and what's just like a splinter movement. 
Um, and there's one called the Children's Crusade. And guess what that is? <coughs> bunch of kids. Uh, this one starts off in a uh, French countryside where this kid about, I think he's supposed to be like 13 or 14 years old, uh, named Stephen, uh, much like the Joan of Arc story, he's out there in, with his family in the farmland, out in the countryside, and uh, starts saying that God came to him and gave him a great message. And the message is that Stephen should try to gather together as many children from Europe as possible. And I think the oldest is only like 14 or 15. And the children of Europe should come together and they should go to the ocean at this place called Marseille, which is in southern France. Um, and when they go down to the shoreline, right on the Mediterranean Sea, God will part the sea, just like the Moses story, and the children will walk from southern France all the way to Jerusalem, and God will open the city to them, and they will take the city and reclaim it for Christianity. Um, why children? Why do people believe this? And a lot of people believe this. So a mob of not just children, but their family members like supporting them, trying to get them to the shoreline. Why do they do this? Why do they believe this? Because they will harm children. Yeah, because children are pure. They have like God's essence and all these kinds of things. So children are uncorrupted. And God will help them. So huge mob of children. Uh, they eventually get to Marseille. Um, and they go down to the shoreline. And what happens? Does God part the sea? No. They get down to the beach, right to the water. Nothing happens. So a lot of them are pretty disappointed. Right? They, some of them travel hundreds of miles. And what do they do at this point? A lot of them start talking about going home. They're disillusioned. Uh, but then some wealthy French businessmen who have some boats say, we totally believe this. So God didn't part the sea, that's okay. We'll give the kids uh, I think it was seven large vessels, seven ships. So that the children can get on the boats and God will bring them across the sea to Jerusalem. So they all start loading up on seven ships. It's a children's crusade, so no adults allowed. And they set sail, and they go out into the sea, and they're never heard from again. <laughs> yep. So we don't know what happened to those seven ships. Um, we know that they set sail. This is a real story. This happened. Uh, about 20 years later, one guy shows up in France and claims to have been one of the children on the boats. <laughs> And he has an interesting story. Uh, he said that, yeah, we set sail, um, and then we ran into a storm, three of the boats crashed, their shipwreck, and those kids probably all died. The rest of the four kind of continue sailing, and as they get close to North Africa, uh, they're captured by North African pirates, and uh, basically all sold into slavery throughout North Africa. And this guy says that uh, I was enslaved for 20 years, and my owner in North Africa let me go and sent me back to Europe to tell the story so that the Europeans would know what happened to their kids. Uh, we don't know if that story is true. That's what this guy was saying. Could have been a guy that, uh, you know, came up with this story and realized that a lot of people would buy him dinner and free drinks when he goes from town to town to tell the story. Uh, we don't know if it's true, but that's uh, really the best amount of evidence on any level that we have for what happened to these kids. So that's the children's crusade. It didn't work out too well. And obviously the Muslim kingdoms are still in control of Jerusalem. So they keep going though. There's more crusades that get proposed and uh, eventually they all fail. Uh, so some textbooks will talk about nine crusades or twelve crusades. I mean it's really a kind of scattering of different numbers. 
you know, like I said, especially after the fourth. Uh, most sources talk about the fourth uh, pretty consistently. Uh, so was the Children's Crusade an official one? Should it have a number? Or is it just like this weird offshoot that is an official? And it's, historians still debate this even today. Uh, the main problem seems to be, though, that the European Crusaders did not trust each other. That even when they win battles and conquer land, they start fighting over each other about who should own the land and govern the land and who should profit off the land. Uh, so they're constantly bickering amongst each other. And that seems to uh, destroy any ability to control or occupy the place for the long term. And uh, in the end, uh, the violence in Europe just keeps going. So uh, the Crusades did not accomplish any of their goals. Outside of the First and Second Crusades, they controlled Jerusalem for a little while, but they eventually lose it. And there's all kinds of bloodshed, especially the First Crusade. Reportedly, when they conquered Jerusalem, they massacred every Muslim they could find. So it's uh, massively violent. And uh, you know, a lot of people living in that part of the world remember this and uh, call what Europeans do today in that part of the world is basically modern crusades trying to control the land for the long term. Uh, like the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, if you listen to the news sources coming out of that part of the world, uh, they're almost all calling this a new crusade. So I had long-term memory and uh, makes sense for them to remember such a thing because it's massively violent and upsetting. Um, so, questions about the Crusades at all? Nope. All right. Uh, last part is uh, religions affect, especially on education. Uh, it eventually becomes known as scholasticism. Uh, going back to the early 1000s, um, Really, the only big church, uh, the only big schools being built throughout Europe are run by the church, the unified Christian church, the Pope's church. Uh, they're, on the local level, they're mostly monasteries. And often uh, the students take vows of silence and they you know, study intellectual stuff and study parts of the Bible and whatnot. Uh, so education within the monastery system, going back to the early 1000s, is uh, mostly controlled by the church. Uh, the most popular book is the Bible, and that's what people are learning to read and write out of. So they're copying Bible verses. Um, so education was mostly controlled by the church. It was a religious education. Um, by about the mid-1000s or so, you start getting more secular schools, more independent of the church. And a lot of these are not built with big buildings or anything, but a lot of them are kind of local teachers who start organizing schools uh, and they start holding class wherever they can get a room and even you know hotels or pubs or bars or any kind of place. Or a large room in someone's house, I mean, anywhere. So these local schools uh, start gaining uh, very strong reputations because they're not just teaching religious ideas, uh, they're teaching more secular ideas. So there's a lot of criticism and questioning, and they especially start going back to uh, ancient texts, especially coming out of ancient Greece. So they'll start studying things like Plato and Aristotle and whatnot again. That's where this stuff is kind of rediscovered in Europe. Does that make sense? Yes? No? All right. Um, the problem, though, for the secular schools, I mean, the religious schools run by the church, they have a certain amount of protection because they're basically the Pope's employees and the Pope has political contacts with all these kings and he can make deals uh, to stop these uh, monasteries from being attacked politically from you know, knights and soldiers and whatnot. These secular schools don't have any protection. They're not affiliated with the church. Um, and they're not usually run by government either. So, if they start studying things or assigning readings that are critical of whatever local king or count or whatever, um, that can really put them in a bad position where the 
political leaders, the wealthy of the area might just want to take them out, just get rid of them, because they're spreading dangerous ideas. Does that make sense? So the faculty, uh, groups of teachers start getting together and trying to organize themselves for their own protection. And this gets involved with economics, where a lot of these more secular schools, they start calling themselves what we would today say, uh, call university. Uh, universitas is a Latin term for like the bringing together of teachers and students. So that's the beginning of our word for university. And the faculty, the teachers, uh, sometimes just two or three teachers in one or two different rooms, in order to def defend themselves politically, they don't have weapons, they're not trained, so they realize that their strength is economic. These schools, even on small scale villages and towns, they start gaining such a good reputation for educating people. Like the students who graduate from some of these schools go on and work for governments, they start their own businesses, they get wealthy and powerful. So a lot of wealthy families want to send their kids to these schools. Does that make sense? To get their children well trained and educated so they can continue the family's prosperity. So a lot of wealthy families start sending their kids to these schools and when you get younger people gathering together in a town, um, their families want them to be well supplied and they're rich. So these kids come into these little universities with money. And so those kids will rent out nice hotel rooms or they'll rent out a room in a local rich person's house. And they're paying rent, they're spending money. They buy a lot of food, they buy a lot of wine, they buy a lot of clothes. They're contributing to the local economy. Does that make sense? To the point where a lot of towns, their whole economic development is built around these schools. You see that? They're building up the local economy. Suddenly the farmers have uh, rich customers to buy their food and their wine or their clothes or their tables or whatever they're selling. So these faculty groups will use that economic threat. They'll basically say, unless the local king or the count protects us, we'll just pick up our school and move it somewhere else. So they don't have official buildings. They haven't built anything. All they have to do is decide, okay, we're going to be offering classes uh, 10 miles to the east then all students have to pick up and move all their stuff. The money leaves town and the community is bankrupted. You see how that operates? And the political leaders respond and they will often off, offer real world protection to these kind of growing universities just to keep them in town because the economic activity is so beneficial. It's the same thing you see with sports teams today, right? Sports team says, I want a new stadium and it's going to cost a billion dollars and I don't want to pay for it. So they go to the local mayor or a governor or county leaders or something and they say, build me a stadium. And what happens if the politicians refuse? They lose money. How do they lose money? Yeah, the team picks up and they go somewhere else. All right, we've seen this happen cyclically over the last 20 years. When a city government says, "No, we're not going to spend a, we're not going to take a billion dollars out of our schools and highways just to build you a stadium," that's stupid. That team will just pick up and go somewhere else to some city that will make that promise. Yeah, well, that was LA's problem 20 years ago. LA didn't want to build stadiums or update stadiums at least for the two local football teams so they both pick up and left. And this has happened with baseball teams, it's happened with hockey teams, it, it, it happens all over the place. 
because they know they have that economic threat. If the team picks up and goes somewhere else, this city just lost you know, thousands of jobs and construction projects and all kinds of things, right? And all the restaurants and bars and hotels around that stadium that doesn't have a team anymore, their business just disappeared. So it's an economic threat that you still see happening today, just back then it's with schools. So these uh, university faculty are economically powerful, not because they are rich themselves, but because of the economic activity they bring to an area. And they start uh, building themselves up almost like guilds. Um, where if you study with a certain teacher for so many years, you can become like an independent thinker, which means you're a bachelor. Um, and when you, if you study even more, take more classes or write a thesis or something, you become a master of that topic. And the highest level, you can become a doctor of that topic, a doctor of philosophy, which is basically what a PhD is today. And they model that off of uh, carpenters and you know, master craftsmen, all kinds of different fields. Does that make sense? So they're becoming institutionalized, and they have all kinds of different regalia, and people with certain degrees get to wear certain kinds of clothes, and that's where you get all the graduation gowns and the hoods and all the little decorations and stuff. Because <coughs> if you go back to the picture, you can see that the teachers actually walk around in the university wearing that stuff with the cap and gown all the time. That's what differentiated them from the students. That one's obviously fallen by the wayside, except on graduation day, right? Oh, already? Um, let's see. So as these universities start growing, especially the secular ones, uh, they start accessing especially ancient documents from ancient Greece and Rome. They kind of rediscover a lot of this stuff and they start reanalyzing it. So there's a growth in scholarship and kind of intellectual life in Europe uh, starting in the 1000s. And a lot of textbooks call that scholasticism. And their general system becomes known as the dialectic, which basically means constructing logical arguments. So a lot of these schools are kind of like law schools today where they have all this stuff that the students read and the students have to construct arguments and they hold debates. And they're, uh, they try to make them as purely dedicated to logical argument as possible, take out the emotion and uh, all the logical fallacies and whatnot. And by the early 1100s, uh, the guy that gets most famous for doing this, like one of the giant writers and teachers and whatnot, is named Peter Abelard. And he basically uh, just attacks every logical system, trying to find its flaws, and just destroys every logical system he encounters. Which was really offensive to the church. Because Avalon's approach was to attack every logical system. The church is one logical system. So a lot of church leaders saw Avalon's um, career as a giant attack against church doctrine. And so they went after him for that. So they basically ran an investigation on him and found out that he had secretly been married which is a big kind of social problem at that time. So he had this mistress that he had secretly married, and they uh, really attack him publicly for that. And uh, he has to basically go to Rome and have an audience with the Pope to ask for forgiveness. And as he's traveling to that, he gets sick and dies. So that's the end of Peter Abelard. Um But a lot of the scholastic movement is almost entirely focused on these ancient texts. Uh, there's not a whole lot of creation of really newer ideas yet. And almost all of this is uh, based in uh, logical argument, logical attacks and whatnot. Uh, their favorite in medieval Europe is really Aristotle. Uh, when they rediscover Aristotle's ancient writings, they start 
relearning them and memorizing them and building all kinds of logical arguments off of his writings and logical constructions. And they really love Aristotle because he wrote a whole lot on all kinds of different topics. So he was, to them, like one of the great geniuses of all human history. And they tend to think that a lot of these ancient texts, especially Aristotle's, that they're perfect. That they're almost infallible. Which obviously creates problems for their own kind of development of new ideas if they're really just kind of almost intellectually worshipping stuff that's already been written down. Then all you have to do is memorize that stuff and understand it, and that's as far as you can go. So there really isn't a creation of a kind of new way of thinking or questioning yet in Europe. So this is not a scientific revolution looking for new data or observing evidence and coming up with new ideas. It is mostly memorizing what's already been done and understanding it. Uh, one problem for the church, though, is that uh, Aristotle argued that the universe is eternal and without creation. Because Aristotle said that the universe is here, it must go way back, it'll last forever. Uh, it wasn't created by anything because that means that nothing had to create something. And Aristotle argued that that's kind of logically impossible. So what did the church interpret that as? No creation. Yeah. There's no creation, there's no creator, there's no God. So the church didn't like Aristotle so much and tried to argue against uh, all these Aristotle followers uh, throughout the scholastic era. Um, and one guy comes along. Uh, and basically, scholasticism is building up this conflict between Aristotle versus the church. Um, and one guy comes along named Thomas Aquinas and he's a member of the church and he puts out this argument that um, that reason uh, logical argument, logic the Aristotle method and the church faith they are not enemies they shouldn't be attacking each other they shouldn't be harmful to each other um, Aquinas argues that they're complementary they work together so you shouldn't be taking sides. You should be involved with both. And his giant quote is, uh, uh, reason, logic, starts you on a path that only faith can fulfill. They can start off with logical argument, but eventually you get to a point where you have to believe it. And he says that's where the role of religion comes in. So Aquinas got really famous for this theory. And uh, after he died, the church makes him to a saint. So he's now known as St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and the church eventually proclaims that uh, Aquinas' argument is the theory that justifies the church's existence in the first place. So Aquinas is a big, big celebrity uh, within Christian history. And uh, after the 1500s, you get the split within Christianity where some people stick with the Pope's church and they become known as Catholics, Catholicism. And other groups protest the church and they go off and start their own movements. They become known as Protestants. So Aquinas is mostly powerful, has his argument within Catholicism today. But that split doesn't happen until the 1500s, so all of ancient European history or Western Civ, uh, and basically it's all unified Christianity. Um, as you get further into the 1200s and into the 1300s, uh, some scholars start questioning the dialectic, this logical construction. They basically argue that it's too dry, uh, it's too unemotional, it's too 
Like, it's too textbook, basically. So they argue that, yeah, you'll take some students, and the ones that are just naturally really good at just understanding things by reading it from a book, understanding these abstract theories, uh, they can deal with the dialectic pretty easily. But for a lot of other people out there in society, if they're not being trained in that kind of stuff, they're not going to understand any of these scholarly arguments, any of this intellectual stuff. So a new movement becomes humanism, which is basically you have to take the intellectual messages, the arguments, and you have to like put them in stuff that general people can access and understand, like music, or plays, or poems, something that people kind of enjoy more popularly. Does that make sense? So today it would be like TV shows or music or films or something like that, where you go watch this movie because it's an entertaining movie, but it still has pieces of the dialectic argument in there. Does that make sense? To get the idea to the popular masses. So the dialectic is like academic and very rigid, textbook-like, and humanism is more emotional, more popular.